Our next speaker is a professor of media, culture, and communication at New York University. Before joining NYU, he was a director of film studies at John Hopkins University. He's the author of several books, including Boxed In, The Culture of TV, The Bush Dis Lexicon, Observations on a National Disorder, Cruel and Unusual, Bush Cheney's New World Order and Fooled Again, The Real Case for Electoral Reform. He's also the editor of Loser Take All, Election Fraud and the Subversion of Democracy, 2000 through 2008. This, our next speaker is featured in a documentary about the loss of civil liberties called Orwell Rolls in His Grave. Who saw this? Yeah, still very relevant and more actually. Uh, our speaker also has been speaking out on the official lies and cover up of 9-11 since 2005 at our 9-11 anniversary event at St. Mark's Church. He supports the effort for a ballot in initiative in New York City and we're thrilled to have him today. Please welcome Mark Crispin Miller. Well, hello. Uh, the reason why it took me until like 2005 to start speaking out on this issue is that I was preoccupied with, with, with another issue, which was the issue of stolen elections. And I think some people in this room probably know what it's like to become obsessed with something like that. <laughs> I'm just guessing, right? You become kind of a monomaniac and you, you know, grab everybody you can get your hands on and you, they think you're crazy and so on. Anyway, that was my relationship to the issue of, of our stolen elections. Uh, I was consumed by this. So uh, I was one of the few people to notice something, uh, or I should say something else, that was troubling uh, just around the time of 9-11. It was on November 12, 2001, that we got the news that uh, the uh, National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago, uh, subsidized by the major media outlets, had completed its year-long count of all the ballots cast in Florida in the 2000 election. Do you remember this? Okay. Um, the, the, the reason, well, the story that we all got from all those media outlets was that the ballot count of all the votes that is all the ones that hadn't been destroyed, uh, that had been cast in Florida in the uh, you know, Bush v. Gore election contest, showed that Bush had won. Okay? That's, what, that's what everybody reported, to the point that if you ask anyone today who has a memory of that, uh, what, the, what the vote count finally demonstrated, they will say, yeah, it showed that Bush won after all. The reason why this, this <laughs> troubled me was that it was false, okay? It was false. The count of all those ballots in Florida, not just in the three counties that were at issue in South Florida, right? If they had only counted those ballots, Bush would have won. But if they had counted all the ballots in the state of Florida, including so-called overvotes, which, which is appropriate, Gore won. There is no scenario under which Bush won. None. Now, Len Downey of the Washington Post was later heard to say that the reason why they, they, they pitched the story that way, that is to say, confirming that Bush won, was that we were at war now. Right? I mean, how, how could we possibly report that Bush wasn't actually president? How awkward that would be. You know what I mean? So, the patriotic thing to do the pragmatic thing to do is simply to say, yeah, you won, okay? Now, as I say, I was uh, concerned about this for years. <laughs> I, I then was even more concerned to see that the 2004 election was stolen. There is actually no evidence that Bush won that election. Does that sound like an overstatement? The only evidence that Bush won that election is the official claim that he won it, which isn't really very compelling evidence. Uh, at any rate, I'm bringing this up because uh, I, I, all the time that I was doing this work, 
I had the same experience with my book that Bill Pepper has had with his books, you know, no reviews and so on. No one would have me on to talk about them on NPR and, and that kind of thing. It was a real, it was a black out on, on the book. There's no question about it. Meanwhile, I was enviously watching the growth of this movement, right? Because this is a pretty big movement and it's a pretty successful movement. And I was, I was envious because there is nothing analogous in the field of election reform. I mean, it, it is by contrast with this movement, just a tiny cult of obsessives <laughs> who, who, who don't even get along with each other, you know, you know what I mean? Which, which tends to happen. Anyway, um, you know, people from 9-11 Truth would contact me and I'd say, yeah, yeah, uh, yes, you know, I know, I know, I know. I mean, you only have so much, as they say, bandwidth, do you know what I mean? <laughs> but um, I, I realized a couple of things. First of all, they're not really two separate stories. They're one story. Because they had to put Bush in the White House in order to pull this off, right? Let me, wait, let me make clear that, that uh, I'm, I'm not succumbing to the, the naive delusion that the two parties are fundamentally different. But I do think that if Gore had been allowed to serve his term, there would have been a few uh, things that happened other than what actually did happen. Like th they would have gotten cracking on global warming a little sooner. I feel confident in saying that. They would have had a different energy policy. And I actually don't think they would have done 9-11 because the neoconservatives who were pushing for that, who had tried to get Clinton to attack Iraq in 1998 and he wouldn't do it, you know, you know, they, they needed to seize the White House, okay? So, so the two stories are really related in that way. But they're related in a more important way. And that is that those two stories are only two of many that have been uh, forbidden, that have been ruled out as a fit subject for public debate and ruled out in the same way. In other words, what happened to me in my book uh, had, had also been happening to the 9-11 movement and still is, despite its far greater size. And that is that, that the cudgel of conspiracy theory was used to completely discredit any attempt to discuss it. That's what I want to talk about here today, okay? I'm going to take you back to a, another 9-11 in its way just as horrible for the people concerned, and that was 9-11 in 1973. Okay, that's when the CIA helped the Pinochet regime uh, uh, destroy a democratic government and replace it with a fascist regime uh, headed by General Augusto Pinochet. In 1974, a book came out from a, a CIA-connected publisher called Chile's Marxist Experiment by a guy named Robert Moss, who was, um, had been a, a, a reporter at The Economist, a very close friend of the far right, extremely close to the, to the military regime in, in Chile and on the CIA payroll. This is from the beginning of his book. In the demonology of the left, Latin American coups are by definition the work of the CIA, working in collusion with sinister right-wing camarillas devoid of popular backing. But the coup in Chile was not an everyday uh, uh, Latin American putsch. The armed forces did not move in a political vacuum and their decision to intervene had nothing to do with Washington. Okay? Uh, those in, listen, the, mom? <laughs> what was that? <laughs> well, listen, will all, wait a minute, will all the police officers in the room please turn off their phones? You know who you are. <laughs> we don't, but you know. <laughs> Wait, let me just those listen. Just listen to the rhetoric here. Those ensnared in the elaborate mythology that was woven around the Marxist regime will no doubt continue to believe, as an article of faith, that Allende went down under the slings and arrows of the CIA uh, and maybe the rich world in general, despite the fact that there is plenty of evidence that the coup was homegrown and widely supported. The whole book is in that vein. So in other words, if you think the CIA had anything to do with that coup, you're, you're crazy. 
You, you are a believer in demonology. You are ensnared in a mythology. Okay. For, the, for kids in the room, um, trust me when I tell you that there is ample evidence the CIA backed that coup and ran it, paid for it. There's a book called The Pinochet File that I strongly recommend. It's like yay thick. And it's all these declassified documents. Peter Kornblow, the National Security Archive. There's no question about it. It was not a myth. It was not a lie. It was a fact. But it was interesting and significant and typical that this propaganda that served the purpose of making that seem like a crackpot notion. By the way, the copy that I consulted at the New School Library, it had a, it had a book plate on the inside cover, Compliments of the Chilean Embassy. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, I wonder where, okay. Now, my second example, I have three. This is from the autobiography of Richard Helms, CIA director, um, arguably involved in the Kennedy assassination. Uh, well, I, I don't have to get, let me simply say the preface to this book, which is called A Look Over My Shoulder, uh, was written by Henry Kissinger. And he has a few pages on the Kennedy assassination, which, you know, some would argue was his fault, even if he wasn't responsible for it because he's the one who, without telling the Kennedys, had continued the program of working with the Mafia to kill Castro. And that had, anyway, you know, see, I'm starting to sound like I'm crazy. I'm gonna go off on this tangent, you know. At least I'm not using any AV, right? Okay. Okay, listen to this now. The events concerning that ever so sad day, he's talking about the assassination of Kennedy. It was ever so sad. The events concerning that ever so sad day have all been laid bare and documented. I have only a few observations to make. First, all of the speculation and conspiratology notwithstanding, I have not seen anything, no matter how far-fetched or grossly imagined, that in any way changes my conviction that Lee Harvey Oswald assassinated Kennedy and that there, was, there were no co-conspirators. But consider the logic of what he just said for a minute. No matter how far-fetched or grossly imagined, he mean, if it, was, if it was really far-fetched and grossly imagined, it might change his view? <laughs> does it just make no sense? Furthermore, I know of no information whatsoever that might have any bearing on the assassination that has been concealed from the public. OK, well, that, <laughs> you know, where does one even begin? For one thing, the CIA to this day has refused to release one million pages of documents that Congress ordered them to release years ago. Okay, after uh, Oliver Stone's movie came out. They're supposed to release these documents, they've refused. Okay, let me simply say of these two people that they, they were, in a sense, professional liars. You know, Robert Moss was a professional liar. He was a propagandist working for the CIA writing untruths. And Richard Helms, of course, is a trained CIA officer and the you know, director of operations and the head of the whole shebang, had been trained in the arts of deception and manipulation and was also in, in, you know, convicted of lying to Congress about the coup in Chile. So they're not exactly the most credible spokespersons for their respective positions. But here's what's upsetting. Here's what's troubling. I'm going to read you something now from a book by an entirely different expert, someone I admire whose work is excellent, and that's Naomi Klein. This comes from The Shock Doctrine, which I, I, I strongly recommend. I think it's a great book, but listen to this. Okay. When the September 11th attacks hit the White House, um, wait, sorry. When the September 11th attacks hit, comma, the White House was packed with Milton Friedman's disciples, including his close friend Donald Rumsfeld. The Bush team seized the moment of collective vertigo with chilling speed, not, as some have claimed, because the administration deviously plotted the crisis, but because the key figures of the administration, veterans of earlier disaster capitalism experiments in Latin America and Eastern Europe, were part of a movement that prays for crisis the way drought-struck farmers pray for rain, and the way Christian Zionist end-timers 
pray for the rapture. When the long-awaited disaster strikes, they know instantly that their moment has come at last. So in other words, the idea that they had anything to do with setting it up, impossible, unthinkable, conspiracy theory, right? The problem that we're confronting here today is not just a problem involving the mainstream media, it involves the left press as well. Okay? And, uh, you know, I know, I know this from my own travails in trying to get election fraud uh, publicized, trying to kickstart a movement for election reform. You can't have a computerized election system that's dominated by private companies whose owners and managers are all far-right Christianists. Am I, is that a radical thing to say? So, you know, I, I, I tried to, you know, I wrote this book, etc. I was attacked far more vociferously by the nation and Mother Jones and so on than I was by any mainstream medium, right? Okay, I, there's a bottle of water in front of you. Can I have it? I'm getting thirsty. <laughs> Test it first. Yeah. <laughs> I, I brought it myself. I was wondering if Bill Pepper was wearing a bulletproof vest. <laughs> yeah. but the thing is, if you, two minutes? Oh, gee, you're kidding. Okay, all right, all right. Thank you. Three. <laughs> uh, three, okay. What we're talking about is the, the rise of the use of conspiracy theory as a rhetorical device specifically intended to shut down discussions like this. The book I want to recommend to you is called Conspiracy Theory in America by Lance DeHaven Smith. <laughs> Uh, it was published by the University of Texas Press, and it demonstrates very clearly that the phrase first entered journalistic discourse in this country uh, in 1967. There is a declassified CIA memo that's in the back of the book. It instructs st uh, station chiefs all over the world to use their propaganda assets and friends in the media to discredit a number of recent books on the Warren Commission using, using the following five arguments, and I won't go through those, the fact is, however, we encounter those arguments still today all the time. Like, if there's a conspiracy, somebody would have spoken up by now, things like that, right? Okay, yeah, I know, it's, 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 it's a rare one. Well, yeah, that's true too. But I don't have much time to talk to you. I'm being rushed here. Uh, let me simply say this, and I feel very strongly about this. Something that I've learned from this kind of work over the last many years is that you know most Americans, and by that I don't mean the great unwashed, I don't mean all the boobs out there who presumably buy everything that they're told, because I actually don't believe that that's true. I think people's views are, and opinions are more complicated, their response is more complex. But certainly, our, our good, well-educated liberal friends, most Democrats, etc., people in the press, are no more sophisticated, are no more capable of rational analysis of the facts than anyone in North Korea, you know, than any, than any fanatical Christianist who thinks the universe was created 6,000 years ago, okay, uh, than anyone whom we like to point and laugh at as hopelessly deluded, you know, they don't get it and so on. Anyone who thinks that those buildings could collapse at free fall speed like that because of some office fires, right? Anyone who thinks that Hani Hanjur, who couldn't fly a single engine plane, could pilot the plane that hit the Pentagon, right? Anyone who thinks that Lee Harvey Oswald could fire, did fire those shots that killed JFK? Anyone who thinks that Sirhan Sirhan actually killed Bobby Kennedy? I'm talking about evidence, facts, People who believe that are just as authoritarian in their responses as anybody else anywhere in the world. <laughs> this, this is a, a, a serious, serious problem, okay? That skepticism comes to us uh, uh, as lunacy, right? And what is called skepticism is a kind of snickering disinformation. That's what we get, right? So 
Amy Goodman will have on the kid who directed Loose Change, right, with a goon squad from Popular Mechanics who, who bully him and don't answer his questions. And so what are they even doing on her show, right? And where, where do they get off pretending to have studied the evidence? They have not, okay? Facts are facts. The problem is twofold. First of all, uh, the people who automatically and reflexively mouth these claims, you know, wave away the evidence. They're, 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 they're somehow cognitively impaired because they can't actually entertain scientific evidence and, and, and respond logically to a rational argument. That's a serious problem. I would go so far as to say that everyone who uses the phrase conspiracy theory in this laughingly dismissive way is a witting or unwitting CIA asset. <laughs> and I'll make one, one last point here. Not only, not only are these people uh, you know, incapable of, of dealing with a kind of rational argument and assessing scientific evidence, but they also have succumbed to a kind of historical amnesia. Because as, as Bill Pepper implied, the kind of thing that, that, that happened here on 9-11, this, this uh, concoction of, of an occasion to attack Afghanistan and Iraq and kick off the war on terrorism, this kind of thing has happened time and time and time and time again in American history. Now, we've all heard about Pearl Harbor, right? because of David Ray Griffin's great book and so on. We've all, we all know about Pearl Harbor. We compare this to Pearl Harbor. We've all heard about Operation Northwoods, yeah. right? We've all heard about that, but that, that, you know, that list is, is much too short, you know? If you go all the way back to the Mexican War in 1846, you know, that's James Polk used General Zachary Taylor and his 3,500 troops to deliberately provoke the Mexicans into launching an attack so then that we could claim we were responding to aggression. Okay? Same thing seems to have happened with the Spanish-American War and the explosion of the Maine, right? I have to look at my list there, so many. The Korean War, now I'm not saying that the South Koreans started it, but I am saying that if you read I.F. Stone's absolutely indispensable The Hidden History of the Korean War, you see that the Truman administration and General MacArthur consistently manipulated circumstances to make it look as if uh, China was attacking the free world. And every time it looked like peace might be possible, they did something to make sure that that did not happen. They were constantly recreating the pretext which enabled them, with that forgotten war, to kickstart the military-industrial complex and to uh, institute uh, the draft. I mean, its consequences were really uh, uh, quite drastic considering it's a war that we basically associate with MASH, you know? I mean, what do we know about it? Okay, I'm, I'm almost done, I promise. Okay, the Tonkin Gulf, I mean, I can go on with all these examples. Uh, let me simply add that the same manipulation, the same creation of a pretext has also been used to attack the left for, for a century. Uh, infiltration of labor unions and of radical groups that's going on even today, right? Uh, what we're talking about is a moment at which all our chickens seem to be coming home to roost, to quote a famous American. <laughs> that, you know, what, what happened at 9-11 is already happening again with ISIS, right? I don't know if you've watched the beheadings. Has, has anyone watched the beheadings? I, I, <laughs> I hope I'm not offending anyone, but there are serious problems with those videos of beheadings. Um, the Ukraine crisis, which the press has universally represented as a consequence of Russian aggression and expansionism, was begun by our government with that coup in Kiev and so on. There is no Russian invasion. Okay, I am starting to ramble. I, I will simply... Can I keep going? No, I won't. There's too many. No. <laughs> Let me simply say that what we're all doing here, you know, dis despised as it is and ridiculed as it is, is despised and ridiculed for a very important reason. It is too threatening. It's deeply threatening. Because if we 
are successful at talking around the media establishment and the government. I, I am far more optimistic than Bill Pepper that, that, that we can actually make tremendous strides. <laughs> especially, especially at this moment of unprecedented economic inequality, right? The student debt crisis, which is, which is uh, turning a whole generation of young people into peons. Uh, the reason why the police departments nationwide are now uh, militarized and in constant contact with the CIA is because they know very well that the population won't sit still for this forever. And if we can succeed in making it clear that these charges of conspiracy theory are, 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 a, are just a dodge, just a way to change the subject, you know, just a way to continue to hide the truth, I, I believe that... Uh, we actually might be able to accomplish something really great here. So I'm, I'm honored to be speaking before you all and I, and I assure you that it is not in vain and you should fight the urge to feel that this is a hopeless enterprise because it's far from it. Thank you.